The Censor of Plays, An Appreciation, by Joseph Conrad. A couple of years ago, I was moved to write a one-act play, and I lived long enough to accomplish the task. We live and learn. When the play was finished, I was informed that it had to be licensed for performance. Thus I learned of the existence of the censors of plays. I may say without vanity that I am intelligent enough to have been astonished by that piece of information. For facts must stand in some relation to time and space, and I was aware of being in England, in the twentieth century England. The fact did not fit the date and the place. That was my first thought. It was, in short, an improper fact. I beg you to believe that I am writing in all seriousness and am weighing my words scrupulously. Therefore, I don't say inappropriate. I say improper, that is, something to be ashamed of. And at first this impression was confirmed by the obscurity in which the figure embodying this, after all, considerable fact had its being the censor of plays. His name was not in the mouths of all men, far from it. He seemed stealthy and remote. There was about the figure the scent of the Far East, like the peculiar atmosphere of a mandarin's backyard, and the mustiness of the Middle Ages, that epoch when mankind tried to stand still in a monstrous illusion of final certitude attained in morals, intellect, and conscience. It was a disagreeable impression, but I reflected that probably the censorship of plays was an inactive monstrosity, not exactly a survival, since it seemed, obviously, at variance with the genius of the people. But an heirloom of past ages, a bizarre and imported curiosity preserved because of that weakness one has for one's old possessions apart from any intrinsic value, one more object of exotic vertu, an oriental potiche et mogul chinois, conceived by a childish and extravagant imagination but allowed to stand in stolid impotence in the twilight of the upper shelf. Thus I quieted my uneasy mind. Its uneasiness had nothing to do with the fate of my one-act play. The play was duly produced, and an exceptionally intelligent audience stared it coldly off the boards. It ceased to exist. It was a fair and open execution. But having survived the freezing atmosphere of that auditorium, I continued to exist, laboring under no sense of wrong. I was not pleased, but I was content. I was content to accept the verdict of a free and independent public, judging after its conscience the work of its free independent and conscientious servant, the artist. Only thus can the dignity of artistic servitude be preserved, not to speak of the bare existence of the artist and the self-respect of the man. I shall say nothing of the self-respect of the public. To the self-respect of the public, the present appeal against the censorship is being made, and I join in it with all my heart. For I have lived long enough to learn that the monstrous and outlandish figure, the Mago Chinos, whom I believe to be but a memorial of our forefathers' mental aberration, that grotesque potiche works, the absurd and hollow creature of clay seems to be alive with a sort of surely unconscious life worthy of its traditions. It heaves its stomach, it rolls its eyes, it brandishes a monstrous arm, and with censorship, 
like a bravo of old Venice with a more carnal weapon, stabs its victim from behind in the twilight of its upper shelf. Less picturesque than the Venetian in cloak and mask, less esteemable, too, in this, that the assassin plied his moral trade at his own risk, deriving no countenance from the powers of the Republic. It stands more malevolent, inasmuch that the bravo striking in the dusk killed but the body, whereas the grotesque thing, nodding its mandarin head, may in its absurd unconsciousness strike down at any time the spirit of an honest, of an artistic, perhaps of a sublime creation. This Chinese monstrosity, disguised in the trousers of the western barbarian, provided by the state with the immortal Mr. Stiggins, plug hat and umbrella, is with us. It is an office, an office of trust, and from time to time there is found an official to fill it. He is a public man, the least prominent of public men, the most unobtrusive, the most obscure, if not the most modest. But however obscure a public man may be, told the truth, if only once in his life, his office flourishes in the shade, not in the rustic shade beloved of the violet, but in the muddled twilight of mind, where tyranny of every sort flourishes. Its holder need not have either brain or heart, no sight, no taste, no imagination, not even bowels of compassion. He needs not these things. He has power. He can kill thought and incidentally truth, and incidentally beauty, providing they seek to live in a dramatic form. He can do it without seeing, without understanding, without feeling anything, out of mere stupid suspicion, as an irresponsible Roman Caesar could kill a senator. He can do that, and there is no one to say him nay. He may call his cook, Moliere used to do that, from below and give her five acts to judge every morning as a matter of constant practice and still remain the unquestioned destroyer of men's honest work. He may have a glass too much. This accident has happened to persons of unimpeachable morality, to gentlemen, he may suffer from spells of imbecility like Claudius. He may. What might he not do? I tell you, he is the Caesar of the dramatic world. There has been, since the Roman Principate, nothing in the way of irresponsible power to compare with the office of the censor of plays. Looked at in this way, it has some grandeur, something colossal, in the odious and the absurd. This figure in whose power it is to suppress an intellectual conception, to kill thought, a dream for a mad brain, my masters, seems designed in a spirit of bitter comedy to bring out the greatness of a Philistine's conceit and his moral cowardice. But this is England in the twentieth century, and one wonders that there can be found a man courageous enough to occupy the post. It is a matter for meditation. Having given it a few minutes, I come to the conclusion, in the serenity of my heart and the peace of my conscience, that he must be either an extreme megalomaniac or an utterly unconscious being. He must be unconscious. It is one of the qualifications for his magistracy. Other qualifications are equally easy. He must have done nothing, expressed nothing, imagined nothing. He must be obscure, insignificant, and mediocre in thought, act, 
speech, and sympathy. He must know nothing of art, of life, and of himself. For if he did, he would not dare to be what he is. Like that much questioned and mysterious bird, the phoenix, he sits amongst the cold ashes of his predecessor upon the altar of morality, alone of his kind in the sight of wandering generations. And I will end with a quotation reproducing not perhaps the exact words, but the true spirit of a lofty conscience. Often, when sitting down to write the notice of a play, especially when I felt it antagonistic to my canons of art, to my tastes, or my convictions, I hesitated in the fear lest my conscientious blame might check the development of a great talent, my sincere judgment condemn a worthy mind. With the pen poised in my hand, I hesitated, whispering to myself, what if I were, perchance, doing my part in killing a masterpiece? Such were the lofty scruples of M. Jules Lemaitre, a dramatist and dramatic critic, a great citizen and a high magistrate in the Republic of Letters, a censor of plays, exercising his august office openly in the light of day, with the authority of a European reputation. But then, M. Jules Lemaitre is a man possessed of wisdom, of great fame, of a fine conscience, not an obscure, hollow Chinese monstrosity ornamented with Mr. Stiggins' plug hat and cotton umbrella by its anxious grandmother, the state. Frankly, is it not time to knock the improper object off its shelf? It has stood too long there, hatched in Pekin, I should say, by some board of respectable rights. The little caravan monster has come to us by way of Moscow, I suppose. It is outlandish. It is not venerable. It does not belong here. Is it not time to knock it off its dark shelf with some implement appropriate to its worth and status? With an old broom handle, for instance.